Thank you, Lily. Lovely as always. Good morning, everyone. Um, to everyone in the sanctuary and uh, joining us uh, virtually, I'm David Adams, representing the Board of Trustees of the Monta Vista UU Congregation. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, today's service is our annual flower uh, communion. Uh, it's very appropriate for Mother's Day, I think, as a celebration of those who bring new life and joy and beauty into the world, and we're surrounded by all these lovely uh, flowers. Um, before we get to that, though, a few announcements. Um, so next Saturday, May 18th, is game night here at MVUUC. Uh, bring your favorite game. Uh, Robert tells me board games, uh, video games maybe, uh, uh, whatever. Bring your games and friends uh, for an evening of fun beginning at 4 p.m. Um, and all are welcome, all ages, food and drink will be provided. So see Robert um, Tidwell, uh, our Director of Lifespan Religious uh, exploration for details after uh, after the service uh, one week from today Sunday the 19th is our annual May congregational meeting um, this is one of the most important meetings that we hold uh, each year uh, we have to vote on a budget and a slate of candidates for the board and other leadership roles um, and there are some revisions to our bylaws that we're going to be um, examining and voting on. So it's crucial that we have good attendance next Sunday. So please uh, mark your calendars for, uh, for that. Finally, today after the service, um, our treasurer and members of our finance committee uh, will share with us a preview of our proposed uh, budget for uh, the 2024-25 fiscal year, which begins on July 1st. Um, this has been a challenging year for us. Uh, fiscally, financially, and we're going to need to make some, set some difficult priorities, I think, and tighten our belts a bit to fund things that need funding for uh, next year. So please stay after the service for a presentation of that. And here, with a follow-up message uh, on that score, is a stalwart member of our finance committee, uh, Mark Moniger. Mark, you want to come up and share with us? Thank you. Thanks, David. <clears throat> Can't remember the last time I've been called stalwart. But, uh, I've called a lot worse, so thank you for that, I guess. Um, okay, inside, I'm going to direct you to your order of service. Um, I don't know if Jarius has this um, slide we showed up last time, but I think it's printed out inside your, inside your order of service. <clears throat> it's a little more expansive because <clears throat> it just talks shows our um, deficit snapshot that we talked about last Sunday and then we have some new things on here are things that were not included so if you think things were bad last time I was up here and the last time that Paula was here um, hopefully this might shake you to your financial core um, as we talked about we have uh, about 21 pledges have not been turned in and of those that have been turned in and have given us their um, pledges for the year, we still come up with a, about a $24,000, $40,000 deficit based on the basic expenses that this <clears throat> congregation needs to um, survive or just to, to exist. Um, staff salaries, our minister's salary, uh, utilities, you know, insurance and gas and our UUA dues and phone and maintenance and things that we need just to run day to day is on your page on the left side called basic expenses. And if you add those up along with our new pledges, you know, you can see there's about a $40,000 deficit, but that's not the whole story. There are other expenses that um, are were not included on here that we expect to come up and that's on the right page. Repairs to our backflow is estimated at $10,000. We have a heating issue in the Montessori offices. We're going to need to do some type of replacements for, for that uh, organization. <clears throat> the electrical panel, the fire alarm, which we did have paid, may or may not be working properly because our electrical panel may not be large enough to support the request for the fire system that the fire department um, added, asked us to, demanded us to upgrade. Um, and then you've got all these different committees that are requesting um, some money for certain event, their events and their, their interests. 
and those are going to have to be postponed or denied unless we get more finances. So we're going to go into more detail, and I think you're going to find when Carissa sp speaks this afternoon after the service, there's even more things that are not included in this, uh, and we'll have a little bit more line-by-line -line items so you get a better chance of, of knowing what we, uh, where we are and what we need to do. So what we have asked uh, the Finance Committee is on this second page here, okay, is kind of like our love gift, a one-time love gift. Um, some people call it an assessment. This, uh, I think this is a time for us to, to really sit down and say, what's it going to take to, to maintain this facility, maintain the place that we love, uh, be able to keep some of our basic uh, services, have our music here. Um, this is a one-time gift that we're asking all members to add to in addition to their pledge. Um, I added 10% to my pledge for the year to get up to 5,000, and I am now going to add another 10% and add another $500 as my one-time pledge. But give what you can. I know times are kind of tough for some people and those that are on Zoom right now. I don't know if you get a chance. You can't maybe can't see it because you're not. Um, it's not on the slide. But um, it's it's a situation that we need to all gather together as one and support our congregation with the gifts that we can. Um, it's going to be a challenging year, and um, but we want to do what we need to do to make it happen. So please stay for the uh, post-meeting to get a more descriptive uh, analysis of our budget. This is something that, we, that the congregation has requested that we do <clears throat> prior to the annual budget. So if you have any questions, uh, this afternoon is the time to, to answer them. Okay? So please fill this out today. Was there a place, Krista, that we were going to have people put these if they're going to fill that out today, I don't know where Carissa went. Outside the main office. Okay. So, so this is what we had talked about last week that, that didn't get put in the order of service. And so now it's in the order of service. And we'd like you to, um, A, if you haven't pledged, please turn your pledge card in first. But then also um, do what you can to add to, our, uh, to your pledge and add to the gifts to keep our sacred space maintained. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the service. Yeah, on that news. Um, <laughs> so, I am Catherine Rowley and we are, ooh, I am seeing that the bowl is down on the table. We are, um, and still without its finger. Um, <laughs> so, I have uh, been your lay leader. The, this is my third week, and I have um, so excited to have Debbie Skirto helping with this service today. So we're both going to um, lay lead this beautiful service. So and um, so I am going to start our service now. So with that, we um, sound the bowl three times. We sound it once for those who came before the Tongva people and other native peoples of this land um, who were its original stewards. We also honor our ancestors and the founding members of this congregation. And of course, we honor Norbert Chopek. Um, we, so here it goes, let's see how this pen works. Um, we sound it once for those of us here and now for our members, our friends, our visitors, our staff, and all of our extended UU family who we hold and care and grow as beloved community. We sound at once for the future, future of this place, and for all those who will eventually come to find belonging here. Um, and call MVUC their spiritual home in the days ahead. And I open with these words by James, uh, I'm John Broughton. I am the old dreamer who never sleeps. I am timekeeper of the timeless dance. 
I preserve the long rhythms of the earth and fertilize the rounds of desire. In my evergreen arboretum, I raise flowering hopes for the world. I plant seeds of perennial affection and wait for their passionate blooms. Would you welcome that sight if you saw it? Revalue the view you have lost? Could you wake to the innocent morning and follow the risks of your heart? Every day, I grow a dream in my garden where the beds are laid out for love. When will you come embrace it and join in the joy of the dance? And I call it on the Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you on this beautiful, beautiful day. And Happy Mother's Day to all the moms and to all the people that were born from moms. And it's just, it's a, it's a great day to celebrate. Um, I would like to call one, a couple of our new members up to light our chalice today. And so I'm asking Lynn Maria and Marie Smith to come forward and light our chalice. We thought this was appropriate because Lynn Maria is our resident florist who's done so many of the beautiful arrangements you've seen here. So welcome also to our Zoom family. Beautiful. Perfect. We light this chalice today. The symbol of our shared faith is Unitarian Universalists and a symbol of the flame that burns individually in the depths of each of our hearts. Also, we light it in gratitude for Norbert Fabian Chopek and in celebration of his legacies, which continue to enrich and deepen our faith. Would you now stand as willing and able to say our covenant? We will also sp uh, sing Spirit of Life following that and sing the children now. So if you're able to rise. We affirm that love is the greatest purpose of this congregation. The search for truth is our constant star and service is our prayer. We pledge our hearts, minds, and hands to challenge injustice with courage, to make choices for a healthier planet, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as beloved community. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life. And may I add that during singing of Spirit of Life, if you would like to come up and if you would like to come up and bring any other flowers that you may have. Uh, did we get them all? Any more flowers coming up? Oh, well then we can just enjoy singing. Great. Okay. Any of the kids that are here, come up and get your chalice. 
and we will sing you out and hope you have a wonderful time at Religious Exploration. Here's Brooklyn. going to go ahead and have our offering now. We have some special music and um, Jill Regal is going to come up and sing for us. And um, you know our generosity supports and sustains this beloved congregation and our chosen community organizations also. Our share of the plate offering in May is the Foothill Family Shelter and a representative is coming next Sunday to give us a little more information about that shelter. So, Jill and Lily. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, I dedicate this song to all the mothers and all the other mothers <laughs> who helped raise our children. This is Love in a Home. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Debbie is going to go and fetch the any joys and sorrows that may be in our basket because I totally forgot to run down there because I was listening to Jill. You did it, Jill. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, I don't know if there are any. Um, yeah? Let's see. And Jorius, are there any on Zoom? No. OK. <laughs> Thank you. We all know Jorius is in there. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, this is, um, well, this is from Letha and, and Ellen, from Letha. Well, and welcome back from your travels. They're, they're going down to the, <laughs> but um, they've been traveling, but she said, um, Letha's in our hearts, um, which is appropriate on Mother's Day. And um, I know there are many, many things we hold in our hearts that are unspoken. So let us um, take a few moments to hold the, um, the concern and joy that was expressed today. Um, let us just take a few moments to um, connect with our deepest selves. So close your eyes, if you so choose, <laughs> as Unitarians. Um, take a slow, deep breath in and hold it for a few seconds and release it, it out, breathing slowly. Continue taking a slow breath in holding it and releasing it slowly. And as you breathe in and out, in and out, feel your body relax. Allow it to relax. Let go of any tensions that you may have been holding as you entered today. Feel your heart beating. Feel a stillness and a peace come into your body. And let our hearts go out today to those who we hold in concern, to those we know and those we don't know who are afraid and suffering and sick, to those who are sad, and to those who feel hopeless around the world and in our own communities. Let us um, take a few moments to hold mothers in our hearts. We all were born of a mother, and many of us have mothered. And all of us have been mothered, maybe not by our mothers, maybe by another mother or a mothering soul. Let's take a moment to feel the gratitude 
of all the positive aspects that can be conjured up by the word mother. And for all who have birthed, take a moment to especially honor yourselves and the great work you did in your body, nurturing a child. And take this moment to forgive yourself for anything that may not feel comfortable in your heart when you think about the job you did. We all have that, even the best, and we're all the best in a lot of ways we don't even know. Take a time for all of you to think of something, uh, some time, some, something in your heart where you felt that you were mothered and loved. Mother, mothering love is a special kind of love because it's caring, a very caring type of love. And uh, I know in my house, for the longest time, we had Murray, the mothering cat. So mothering can come from many sources. So let us hold those beautiful feelings that mothering can give us. So, happy Mother's Day. Now, let our hearts totally fill further with gratitude and appreciation for all that we have in our own lives, for our homes, the food we eat, the people, the animals, the places we love, our friends, for the beauty of nature, for flowers, for the opportunity to be together this day to celebrate Norbert Chopek, one of our Unitarian heroes, and to participate in our ceremony, the ceremony he created and held in his first church 101 years ago. My pen is gone. Sharpies aren't as good. Um, okay, and we're going to sing. Um, please, um, I know I forgot the little star on the order of service, but please um, rise in body and or spirit and let's sing Love Will Guide Us. It's number 131. today because I get to share with you a beautiful reading. It's written by Reginald Zatoli and it's entitled The Language of the Flowers. Speak, flowers, speak. Why do you say nothing? The flowers have the gift of language. In the meadow they speak of freedom, creating patterns wild and free as no gardener could match. In the forest, they nestle snug carpets under the roof of leaf and branch, making a rug of such softness. At end tip of branches, they cling briefly before bursting into fruit, sweet to taste. Flowers, can you speak joy to our sadness? 
and hope to our fear? Can you not say how it is with you that you color the darkest corner? The flowers have the gift of language. At the occasion of birth, they are buds before bursting. At the ceremony of love, they unite two lovers in beauty. At the occasion of death, they remind us how lovely is life. Oh, would that you had voice, silent messengers of hope. Would that you could tell us how you feel arrayed in such beauty. The flowers have the gift of language in the dark depths of a death camp. They speak the light of life. In the face of cruelty, they speak of courage. In the experience of ugliness, they speak, bespeak the persistence of beauty. Speak, messengers, speak, for we would hear your message. Speak, messengers, speak, for we need to hear what you would say. For the flowers have the gift of language. They transport the human voice on winds of beauty. They lift the melody of song to our ears. They paint through the eye and hand of the artist. Their fragrance binds us to sweet-smelling earth. May the blessing of the flowers be upon you. May their beauty beckon to you each morning and their loveliness lure you each day and their tenderness caress you each night. May their delicate petals make you gentle and their eyes make you aware. May their stems make you sturdy and their reaching make you care. Um, so, I am going to, um, I'm going to do what's been done before, They're a little different, but I'm going to tell you um, the story of the flower communion, and um, I'm going to tell you the story of Norbert Chopek's life. So, as we said, I said before, it's the 101th anniversary of the flower communion. And it is, um, for any of those of you who've been universal, Unitarian Universalists all around the country, it's one of the most popular annual rituals. And it's celebrated pretty much, I believe, in every Unitarian Universalist church that there is, at least in the United States and probably in other places around the world, too. Um, so Norbert um, Chopek was a Czechoslovakian, ex-Catholic, ex-Baptist, religious, um, liberal religious activist who finally found his true calling as a Unitarian minister and who created the Flower Communion for the members of his newly formed congregation in Prague. The story of Norbert Chopik um, can never get old because it is so rich and interesting and because it inspires us and it deepens our faith and reminds us of who we are and why we are Unitarian Universalists. The story um, of Norbert Chopik, who was gassed in a Nazi concentration camp for being a Unitarian minister, thus joining the ranks of Unitarian martyrs who died rather than retreat from their vision and their commitment to the faith. So here's his story. He was born June 3rd in 1870 in southern Bohemia. At the time, Bohemia and all of the lands that were to become che Czechoslovakia were a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which embraced the Roman Catholic Church. There was no religious freedom in this empire, and although a few um, other religious groups were tolerated in name, they were often persecuted. Norbert's family was Catholic, and in his early years, Norbert had considered becoming a Catholic priest. At the age of 14, he was sent to live in Vienna um, with an uncle and an aunt who were Baptists. They were evangelical um, ministers, actually. He traveled and he preached and, um, with them. And um, at the age of 18, he joined their ranks. And as he traveled and preached and um, published widely, he founded a number of Baptist churches. However, as time passed, he became increasingly more liberal in his religious views. He particularly was influenced by the Moravian Brotherhood and by the idea of free Christianity, um, essentially Unitarian in thought. And he played an active role 
in an international organization um, known today as the International Association for Religious Freedom, IARF, IARF, which had been founded by Unitarians in 1900. As Chopek became more liberal, not only the, in matters of religion, but in politics as well, having written a number of opinionated articles on the impending World War I, he began to upset the church and the government. Um, and on the advice of a friend who said he was in serious danger of being arrested, he fled to the United States in 1914. After his arrival in the United States, he was actually tried twice for heresy by a Baptist tribunal, but was acquitted both times. Once he was in the United States, he became the editor of a Czech uh, language newspaper and served as a pastor of the First Slavic Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, and was active in the movement for Czechoslovakian independence. He had been widowed for the second time shortly after arriving to the United States. However, he met a woman who was to become his third wife, um, Maya V. Um, Oktavet, in a New York public library where she worked. She had um, also been born in Bohemia and had immigrated to the United States in 1907. He, she had obtained a degree from Columbia University um, School of Library Sciences. Um, so they were um, intellectually very equally matched. Um, they were married on June 23, 1917. In 1919, Norbert realized that because of his beliefs, he could no longer be a Baptist, and he left the faith. At the end of World War I, Czechoslovakia had become an independent country. Many Czechs had decided to leave the Roman Catholic Church, and many exciting things were happening there with liberal religion. Um, so, it's bleh, sorry, just a second. So they, the um, Chapeks both were full of excitement um, with a vision of returning to their native land to um, play a personal part in the spiritual reawakening of the country. In 1920, they decided to sell their home to get money for the return trip. However, things did not go quite as planned, and they ended out renting an apartment in Orange, New Jersey. There, on January 10, 1921, they joined the First Unitarian Church of Essex County. She's pretty proud of that fact. Um, the minister, Dr. Walter Reed Hunt, learning of Chopek's intent to return to Czechoslovakia, arranged for him to meet the president of the American Unitarian um, Association, Dr. Samuel A. Elliott. By May, Chopek had a commitment from the AUA to support his work in Czechoslovakia, and he and uh, Maya left for Prague on June 30th. In 1939, shortly before the German occupation of Czechoslovakia, um, whoops, I think I skipped the page, sorry, I did, I'm sorry. Um, okay, by 19, um, 22, Chapek had organized the Congregation of Religious Fellowship in Prague. Chapek was a charismatic and inspiring minister, and the hunger for liberal religion was great in a country that had so long been religiously repressed. In June of 1923, Chapek held the first flower communion, or as he called it, the Festival of Flowers. Um, at least that's what it was originally called. It was immediately popular and was held every year thereafter. For several years, the fellowship met in rented halls with financial help from the AUA and the British and Foreign Unitarian Association. They acquired and renovated a medieval palace, which they dubbed Unitaria. And if you're interested, you can see pictures of this online. It was magnificent. <laughs> um, in 1930, the Unitarian Church of Czechoslovakia was officially, officially recognized by the Czech government and the following, for the following 20 years, with the help of their daughter and her husband, um, Norbert Chopek and Maya built a vigorous nationwide religious movement. Their congregation boasted 3,200 members and was the largest Unitarian congregation in the world. Over 8,000 Czechs considered themselves Unitarian. And in 1939, however, um, shortly before the German occupation of Czechoslovakia, Maya Čapek left for the United States to lecture and to raise funds 
for a joint Unitarian and Friends program to assist endangered refugees and internees. Realizing the potential danger Norbert was in, the, U the AUA, I keep wanting to say UUA, AUA, offered positions in the United States to him and to his daughter. However, they declined um, the offers, feeling it was their duty to remain with the congregation. When the war broke out, Maya was unable to return home. In 1940, she introduced the flower communion to the United States at the Unitarian Church um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. As the Nazi occupation progressed, um, the membership in Chopek's church continued to grow. Chopek and the activities of the church were under open surveillance of the um, Gestapo. And for his 70th birthday, Chopek had been given a radio by his congregation. And although it was a capital crime to listen to foreign radio stations, he and his daughter, youngest daughter Zora, listened to the BBC every night to gain news of the war. He shared what he learned with his congregation through subtle parables and stories in his sermons. The Gestapo raided his home, and on March 28, 1941, he and his daughter Zora were arrested and sent to prison. His term was only to be for one year, but after he had been incarcerated for 11 months, it was decided that he was truly a danger to the right, and he was sent to Dachau with his papers stamped unwanted. During his incarceration and internment, he continued to minister to the needs of others. He also held flower communions. After the war, survivors testified to his strength and courage in the face of torture and starvation, and to the inspiration, comfort, and strength to endure that he had provided to so many. He was gassed to death on October 12, 1942. And his wife, Maya, did not learn of his death until after the war was over. Um, and I want to read a poem. Well, I guess it's a poem, or it's a, something he wrote just before he was, um, before he died, which um, survived. So um, he wrote, it is worthwhile to live and fight courageously for sacred ideals. Oh, blow ye evil winds into my body's fire, my soul you'll never unravel. Even though disappointed a thousand times or fallen in the fight and everything worthless would seem, I have lived amidst eternity. Be grateful, my soul. My life was worth living. He who was pressed from all sides but remained victorious in spirit, is welcomed into the choir of heroes. He who overcame the fetters, giving wings to his mind, is entering into the golden age of the victorious. So, before we begin our flower communion, I want to share um, what he believed. Um, he, uh, Norbert uh, believed a religion, um, he believed in a religion founded, and this will sound so familiar, not on dogmas, but as he put it, on a, a divine spark, which is in each person's own soul. This, he believed, appealed to his congregants, who were mostly spiritual refugees from many different backgrounds, Roman Catholics, Jews, Protestants, pagans, etc. Um, they, they tended to dislike religious language, and were wary of religious ritual. However, Chopik felt that they needed to have some kind of a spiritual um, ritual to celebrate and honor um, their diverse community and to acknowledge their willing connection to one another. He created it to symbolically bring his congregation together in a way that it would not exclude anyone. Today, we still celebrate the communion in, in much the same way as it was celebrated originally. So we have placed flowers in the vase, and the vase has been brought forward. We'll read a prayer by Norbert um, Chopek, the one he um, read for the flower communion. And then we'll each come forward, we'll 
come forward one at a time and choose a, a, a different flower than the one we may have brought with us. Um, then we will um, use the words of Norbert Chaba um, to consecrate the flowers. Okay, so as he saw it, the symbolism is understood this way. The flowers, each one representing a unique individual, placing a flower in the vase, signifying that each um, signifying that it is a, each individual's free will that he or she has joined with the other members of this religious community. The vase symbolizing the body of the religious community and the principal covenant which binds it together. Taking a flower from the vase signifying our acceptance of one another and the idea that not only do we give, we also receive. So he said that in picking, um, uh, in the flower community, each of us is choosing a different um, flower that speaks for us, okay? The vase is a symbol of our brotherhood, um, as in brother and sisterhood and all the, other sister, all the others. It is our symbol of our church organization. We need the vessel to help us share um, the beauties and the responsibilities of communal life. In the community, by giving the best that is in us for the common good, we grow. And we are able to do what no person is able to do alone. Each of us needs to receive in order to grow. And for the same reason, each of us needs to give. So before we begin our flower communion, just take a moment to contemplate its meaning for us today in a time of increased, almost an understatement, global discord violence and intolerance. In this time of uncertainty, when it is so easy to despair, it is more important than ever for us to hold on to our ideals, to hold on to one another, for the strength we need to work for our vision and to keep our light burning as a beacon of hope for all. Considering all of the people and the history which brought this ritual to life, and considering that it has been maintained and nurtured for the last 101 years, it becomes so much more than a flower exchange. It becomes an ever relevant living ritual connecting us all to one another through time. So with this, let us, um, let us come up. Maybe you could play some real soft, beautiful music. And if um, you would like to come up and pick a flower, <laughs> and we also invite our Zoom people to go ahead and virtually pick a flower, okay? So, um, <laughs> as, as um, <laughs> there has to be one thing I do not correct. So, um, I didn't say the prayer before <laughs> we took our flowers. So, as you hold your flower, we'll say our prayer, and then we will consecrate them also. Because we wouldn't want to, his, these words are just too good to let go. Um, and we're still good on time. In the name of that which implants the seed of the future in the tree, and in the hearts of humanity, the longing for people living in neighborly love. In the name of the highest in whom we move and who makes the mother, the father, the brother and sister what they are. In the name of the sages and the great religious leaders,
who sacrifice their lives to hasten the coming of peace and justice. Let us renew our resolution sincerely to be real brothers and sisters, regardless of any kind of barrier which estranges person from person. In this holy resolution, may we be strengthened, knowing that we are one family, that, that one spirit, the spirit of love, unites us, and our work together for a more perfect and a more joyful life leads us on. Now we're going to consecrate our beautiful blooms. And this is written by Norbert Chopik. In the spirit of life, let us bless these flowers as messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and a devotion to justice and the search for truth. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing together. May we cherish friendship as one of our most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's differences discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to secure the place that love, respect, hope, justice should have in this world. And now, if you'd like to stand, we're going to sing our closing song, Guide My Feet. And it's number 348, or hopefully on the screen. that last verse on that, but I bet you picked it up. <laughs> um, it's surging surge my heart. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. I think we might need that. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Well, Reverend Maggie will be back next week in the pulpit, and I'm sure she'll be renewed and refreshed and happy to be here. <laughs> um, so our closing words, and then um, we'll all remain standing as we say our unison benediction. And um, I, this is one of my favorites, but um, in a world where all is borrowed and time like elusive dust just seems to slip through our fingers, all we really have are these precious moments where we can make fertile the soil in the garden of our hearts. That here love may make its home and here the mortal seed may flourish. Only love can free us from the womb of time. For life, like a magnificent, mysterious cloud, holds its shape and form only long enough for us to blink. 
and all our precious memories are but shadows of time that will drift away like fallen leaves returning to the emptiness from which they came. Thus, we are, like innocent children, um, flowering in the garden of souls. So, in our um, unison benediction. Okay, let's speak together. As we close our time together and extinguish our chalice flame, may we remember to let love guide us. May we be kind, be brave, be just, be merciful, be hopeful. For when we do, we hold the chalice flame as the guide for our lives and a light for the earth. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>